Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Art Goldhammer, and on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Laura Freider, Jim Cronin, Herrick Chapman, and Julian Boer, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to this session of the Contemporary European Politics Seminar. It's uh, a great pleasure today to welcome uh, Professor Andy Markovitz of the University of Michigan, uh, who's going to talk about his book, uh, The Passport as Home. Uh, when we planned this event, uh, we had not anticipated that it would occur on this very somber day uh, following the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I'm sure Andy is going to mention this in his remarks, uh, but uh, I did want to take note of that fact at, at the outset. Uh, the format for today's event is uh, going to be an interview. Uh, we'll start with uh, about 10 minutes of uh, scene setting by Andy himself, and then turn to uh, Anne Sada, who is Professor of Government Emerita, and Joel Parker, Professor of Law and Political Science Emerita at Dartmouth, uh, who will question Andy about his uh, uh, early uh, childhood. Uh, then the second interviewer will be me, uh, and I will uh, uh, be uh, interviewing Andy about uh, his uh, first experiences of the United States and his time as a student at Columbia. Uh, and then finally, we'll turn to Peter Hall, who is a uh, Krupp Foundation Professor of European Studies in the Department of Government at Harvard and a faculty associate here at the uh, Center for European Studies, who will interview uh, uh, Andy about his uh, time at CES. Uh, since uh, Andy's book covers uh, a great many topics, and we have only an hour. Uh, I'm not going to do any further introductions, and uh, we'll turn immediately to Andy to uh, set the stage uh, by describing his book for us. So, Andy, the floor is yours. Well, Art, thank you so much. This is an amazing event for me, uh, a homecoming of sorts. Uh, it is so ample in the book. Uh, CES uh, formed my life. And um, there's so many things to say, be grateful for, even on this very somber day, which I will discuss in a second, uh, by having a, uh, this memoir published by the Central European University Press, which is an American university, uh, but located in Budapest in Vienna. Uh, so I always say it's our Andy's private university. It's, a, it's my cow and cow university. Uh, so much behooving the book's topic. Um, and my editor actually, uh, Linda Kunosh, is present, I think, somewhere out in the ether uh, in Budapest. Um, I'm really, really uh, uh, touched by this invitation. And let me just summarize the book in two minutes, actually. The book is about uh, the valorization and the full appropriation of a horrible schimpfwort, a horrible pejorative term called rootless cosmopolitan, uh, coined by Andrei Zhdanov and Stalin in the 40s, late 40s. And it was a co code word for Jew. And so basically an anti Semitic term. Um, and I grew up in the Romania of this time uh, under uh, Stalinism, Ceausescu, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Gheorghe Gheorghe Dej, Ceausescu's predecessor. Um, and uh, incidentally, by the way, the four, first female foreign minister of the world was a woman by the name of Anna Pauker. Uh, born Rabinson uh, of an Orthodox Jewish family, and she also was de uh, 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 denounced as a ruthless cosmopolitan. And I basically turned this uh, 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 very negative term into a principle of uh, liberation, of freedom, uh, of uh, 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 sort of a glowing principle of a very happy life uh, that I led. And um, where the only anchor, my only anchor of identity has been my United States passport uh, since that glorious fall morning of September 27, 
71 on the steps of the United States District Court of the Southern District of New York uh, in Lower Manhattan uh, when I was sworn in as a, as a citizen of the United States. And then I took the subway up to Rockefeller Center and immediately got a passport. Um, that's the book, basically. Uh, but today is also the would be my, my father's 111th birthday. He was born on February 24th, 1911. And um, were he alive, we would have been already engaged in major debates about what happened in uh, the, the tragedy in Ukraine. Um, he would tell me, of course, like he always had throughout his life, that the Russians can never be trusted. Um, I described his and my mother's and his their entourage's Russophobia in Timisoara, where I grew up. How my parents ostensibly feared and loathed the Russians much more than the Germans, even though it was the Russians, mainly the Soviet army, the Red Army, which saved their lives. Uh, otherwise, of course, they would have perished in Auschwitz like others in my family well over 20 did. Um, but my father was very much part of what I call the Eastern drift of hatred and contempt, uh, this Ostgefälle, to use a German term, of European relations, which goes somewhat as follows. You dislike all your neighbors, but those to the East, you actually disdain. You look down on them. And uh, that's what he would say about this. Uh, and of course, the Russians can't be trusted. I describe in the book how on August 21st, 1968, my father, his companion, Maria Wilhelm, uh, my beloved, uh, then young girlfriend, 17-year-old, beautiful Kiki, now my wife, um, rushed back to Vienna from Lido di Esolo, basically in panic. And my father was there to somehow detain the Red Army from conquering Austria on its way, of course, of crushing the Prague Spring of Dubček and others. And I described this in the book uh, extensively. Um, but of course, my father's view, by the way, of course, my father is the only hero in the book. Uh, I dedicate the book to him. He was my everything. He was my, to use an American sports term, which is so important to my entire life. He was my one, he was my blocking back. He was my blocker. He, I ran beautiful patterns because he really made it possible for me to do this. And um, two incidents where my father, who really believed that what matters in international politics is all about sort of, uh, uh, disdain, hatred, uh, uh, pride, nothing about structural anything. Um, he always made fun of my explanations of political sociology and political economy because he always thought that what really mattered were slights, was pride, was grandeur, was vision, was envy of, uh, and honor. And I, I think these are the terms that very much describe in better ways of what in fact made Putin do what he did. Um, and there were two incidences where this was very telling. One was I took him to a lecture at Columbia. He always loved to come to lectures in the Columbia. This was by the wonderful Mark Kesselman, who then became my doctoral dissertation advisor. And it was a lecture on De Gaulle, on Gaullism. And afterwards, my father was totally enchanted by this. But then he said, you know, Mark Kesselman really didn't address the essence of Gaulism. And I said, oh, what was that? He said it was his hatred for the Anglo-Saxon. It was his anger, his being demeaned by Churchill and, and, and Roosevelt. That's what is the important thing here. And Kesselman didn't address this. Next point. In, a, in an evening with the one and only Karl Deutsch, um, with Ruth Deutsch, there's a lot in my book. Uh, it's an homage to Carl. Um, my father and I uh, had dinner with them on 25 Lakeview Avenue. And we were talking about uh, uh, Carl's uncle, Julius Deutsch, who of course was uh, the leader of the Austrian Schutzbund, which was the paramilitary organization of the Austrian Social Democratic Party. And uh, Somehow we got onto Austro-fascism and, and the Vaterländische Front and Dolfus. 
And uh, Carl, in his brilliance, gives this you know, eloquent uh, analysis of what this was all about. And afterwards, my father said, you know, Carl missed one important point, which to me is what really de defined all this. And I said, so what? He said, Dolphus was all of five foot one or four foot nine. In other words, the explanation was always one of personalistic hatred that in fact, he basically said that Dolphus created Austro-fascism and the Vaterländische Front because he was short. Um, so much to my father, so much to the day I cease, I desist, and I hand over to my dear colleague and friend, Ann Sada. Gosh. Um, first of all, Andy, thanks for writing this book. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to discuss it. It, it is an extraordinary window on an extraordinary life in, in what, alas, was way too interesting a century. And I guess this century is set to prove equally interesting and full of people on the move, which seems to be our new way of talking about refugees. Um, I, I don't, how shall I put it? I don't know where to start. I think we could talk for hours about, about your early years and how they shaped your late, later life, your academic interests, your um, uh, the joy that you derive from dogs. Uh, just about everything seems, seems to come from these, these early years. I, I want to pick up for, for some people have read it. I'm sure some people have not yet had the chance to read the book. I want to I want to take issue a bit with some of the things that you say. I, I thought one of the really interesting things about the book was how my how how your own perception, how your own expression of your of what you experienced actually changes over the course of the book. And so we kind of follow you as you as you have these different iterations of what you experienced. But the overall impression that you that you that you convey is, as you put it right at the beginning of the book, you say, my rootlessness has caused me much joy and little anguish. Um, and to me, uh, and, and then at the end, I'll, I'll bookend it, and then I'll come back. Uh, at the end, at the very end, you say that the the sole real tragedy that that befell me was losing my mother, which which you know you weren't ten when you lost your mother. So these are the bookending uh, statements about about this early life in a way. Uh, and of course, the dedication to your father and what you just said is another is another statement about about your early as well as your later life. To me, this is really, um, you know, this is this is really it's it's a book about about tremendous loss, and and about dealing with loss and loss aversion and and minimizing loss to people around you, which it seems to me. You know everything from your the 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 choice of topics where empathy played such a large role to your dedication to teaching is in a way about about averting the kind of loss, averting the experience of loss in others, lest they experience what 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 you experienced. So there was the death of your your mother. You've already told us that over twenty of your relatives. Um, died at the hands of the Nazis, and there was Stalinism, of which you say very little with regard to your Timisoara years. You, you, you tell us about it because your father clearly just hated the Soviet Union. Um, so in that sense, we get a window on it, but we don't hear about how you felt, what it was like for you to be a child. So I just want to open it up and let you you know, let you give your sort of bottom line on 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 these themes that that evolve in their exposition over the course of the the book. Oh man, uh, I wow, thank you. Uh, look uh, very briefly so that you can speak more. Uh, you know, we could speak for the entire afternoon on this. What I'm I had actually I do think I did talk about this in the book, and again I it is because of my parents and my entourage, my my aunts, uh, my my aunt Monsi. I actually lived a very beautiful life. I, I knew nothing from Stalinism. 
Uh, I mean, I, in fact, what I knew from Stalinism was joy. I mean, remember Yossif, uh, the, the, the Soviet, the colonel who lived in our, in our apartment. And he took me for rides in his Vilis, in his, you know, in his Jeep. And this was so cool. And here was this Soviet army guy uh, with all his decoration and all this. And he had me on his lap and we drove through, a, through on a, in a military vehicle. I mean, how cool, it can't get more cool than that for a young boy of five or four or five. So to me, Stalinism is really, uh, I mean, I understood that there were fears, uh, that people whispered, uh, that, but actually, personally, I did not experience two things that appear in the book a lot, namely Stalinism and, and, and Nazism and anti-Semitism. The, the first time I encountered these is in the famed World Cup match between Hungary and, and Germany on the 4th of July, 1954. And this is, and, and, and here is this match between Hung Hungary and Germany. And these are the languages that we speak in Kutuzov Street no, number one. Uh, we speak mainly Hungarian, but also German, especially with my mother who valorized German so much. And she loved it so. It's literature, it's, it's uh, totally. And yet I felt from my father that he was not upset that the Hungarians lost. In fact, he then that, that this is when my link to America begins when my father says the only thing that matters to you in this match is that it is on the 4th of July, which is the birthday of this country called the United States. And you know, I'm a five year, not quite five year old kid and I, I, I thought it was deranged or I don't know, whatever. But so what I'm saying is that this is the first time that this appears. My, my parents never talked about the Holocaust. The only time I, I encounter it is when my aunt screams at night. Um, and uh, so I actually, in Timishwara, led a very sheltered existence uh, where, my, where I had private piano lessons, where I, there was the Soviet army guy, where I learned how to play chess. I played button football on the, on the table. So uh, no, my first shock in life was in fact when my mother dies. And a couple of weeks later, we leave Timishara, this cocoon, and we arrive in Vienna, which I start hating because it's, we arrive in Vienna um, uh, and, and it's not where we're supposed to be, namely the United States. And it takes us nine years for me to come to the United States, even though we go every summer. So I actually, Stalinism per se, is and even Nazism per se are don't affect me. Uh, before I pass it to 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 Art, I just want to say that you edited out the other Russian officer. Yes, good point. The other Russian officer was a thug. He was a horror. I don't remember him, and I hope I will never. You know, he was the one who came after Yosef. And he came, he had a little girl and he beat the little girl per, partly, I think every night with his belt. And my mother, God bless her, tried to drown this out because it was, you know, in a small apartment. So we could hear this. And by turning up Mozart and Beethoven full blast. And in fact, this didn't do it well because instrumentals don't. So she resorted to opera. So in came Puccini and Verdi and, you know, all of this to drown out this poor little girl's screams. Um, I don't remember anything else about this guy. And I, I think I say, say this with one sentence, he, does, he doesn't deserve more, but even, even if were I to remember him. Um, uh, but yeah. All right, I think my, are my 10 minutes up? No, uh, I think you have more than 10 minutes, no? You, no, you I'm can, sorry, I, I, I'm, 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 please, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you can take uh, as much time as you like, Anne. If you have more questions you'd like to pose, uh, that's fine. If not, uh, I'll take it from here. Well, I, I, I don't know when you. I, I think that that we should talk about your your relationship with your father and his influence on you. Um, 
you know, maybe we want to do that in three acts and 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 give you a chance to to reflect on it. Uh, because because you know initially we we get we're introduced to your family and and indeed the trauma is that your mother dies and in, and and is and is ill for some time before she dies and 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 then and then you're you're a boy being raised by by a father whom we can, with our adult eyes, assume to be relatively traumatized in all sorts of ways. He has lost, you know, he's lost his parents, his siblings. Um, his two siblings have come back damaged from the camps. Um, he's trying to get a little boy out of a country. He's been, you say at one point, he was expropriated by the- Yes. Yes, he had a little. Uh, he had a company, uh, import export company, and uh, when he comes back from the University of Budapest and settles in Timisoara, uh, and then he's expropriated in 1948, and um, like everybody else was, and he then works in the bank because he has a, a doctorate from the commerce school in Budapest. Um, and then, as the story goes on, uh, we hear far more about the tensions with your father. Um, and and so there's this interplay in the book between between the closeness that you I guess there's sort of three poles. Uh, one there's a there's a closeness between a son and his father, kind of together uh, in a in a difficult world. Then there's at the other end there's there's tension. Um, also kind of normal tension, a growing boy and, and, and a father whose priorities don't always match, whose values don't always match, whose politics aren't always the same. And then in the middle, there's this, there's this really quite fascinating thing where, where, where you're, as you put it in one point, you, you know, you're sort of in competition with your father. And it, it's, it's, it's neither... It's neither the adoration nor the nor the kind of outright tension. It's something in between. So again, I just want to throw it back to you and tell us about this figure with your adult eyes, who's who's who 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 obviously was just an extraordinary person to to have. Look very quickly, so we should get on. I mean, it's again, I could talk, you know, for weeks. Um, yeah, you know. Um, Yes, the adoration is he was in the family. My mother was high art. My, my mother was highbrow culture. My father was also by dint of class a little bit. My mother hailed from a higher uh, class, privately tutored and so on and so forth. And her German was absolutely flawless. My father's German was not flawless. It was accented and grammatically incorrect. Um, but uh, so with him, what tied me was obviously locomotives and above all soccer. And this was so important. Uh, in fact, to this day, I'm convinced that my obsession with sports uh, and my love of music all, all goes back to the only two realms that remained constantly beautiful and uncontested with my father. Those are the only two realms. Everything else was contested. Judaism, women, politics, everything, the school. But somehow, you know, music and sports were these holy places where we could just didn't see, didn't speak much, but felt. And these visits with him to the soccer ground in Timisoara are priceless. Um, uh, you know, so uh, that's you know, the, that's the good part, if you will, will the, 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 the good part. The, the, the one that you mentioned, the competition part is uh, very much over, um, uh, you know, over uh, uh, being better, uh, being more accomplished. Uh, um, again, women, the issue of women, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a form of, it's very, very textured, but it, it, it's, it's there. And the third one was the, 
dimension of sadness. What you wanted to say, write about by losing him or or oh no, I didn't actually, but that's interesting that that, that you could do it. I, I I just you know, I had a sort of childhood relationship where where two two people who've lost a lot are kind of clinging to each other. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes. The, 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 underneath all of this is again my father's uh, immense love for me and also his, in some ways, admiration of me. Uh, and in some ways also his uh, seeing himself through me. Uh, and in fact, that's very much tied to the United States. Uh, my father on his deathbed in Vienna said he was a failure. And he was a failure. And I described this because we went back from America to Vienna and he never succeeded in America. And he said he was, I was Java. I remember the word Hungarian. I was, I was, uh, I was a coward. I was a coward not to confront America and have my better German dominate and get you back to Vienna, which he, my father hated, and I hated. And it was seen for my father, even though he created a very nice life in Vienna, he saw it as a defeat. And so to him, the only thing that mattered was that I should make it in the golden of Medina. Interestingly, of course, he never used that word because of course this would have been Yiddish. And Yiddish to him was lower class, was jargon. Because of course that's not the Jews. And this again was very important about the New York part where I meet Jerry Cates. I become this American Jew by virtue of a Canadian East European Jew. And it was not by Eastern Europe. So when I went to see Fiddler on the Roof for the 19,000th time, and this time put on by the wonderful University of Michigan School of Theater uh, 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 and Dance, um, music and dance this past Saturday. Um, and of course, I was crying through the whole thing. Uh, it occurred to me that this is, of course, is not the Judaism that I grew up in. It's not what American Jewry's core really is. Uh, I grew up in a much more sort of German Jewish, but in a different, and also by virtue of class. And um, uh, so back to my father, he always saw America, and above all, not only America, but also being an academic. My father oh, really became a businessman, but he, in essence, was an intellectual. He read and he read and he read, and he always loved to be, wanted to be, he would have liked to have been a professor. And um, I became a professor. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you, Anne. Uh, I think uh, I'll take it from here. Uh, I too am going to ask you about your father, but I'm going to come at it obliquely. Uh, but before that, I should say uh, what immense pleasure I took from reading your book. Uh, it's uh, really a, a joy and a pleasure to read, beautifully written and uh, uh, wonderfully evocative about two worlds, uh, Europe and the United States. So I learned about both. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things I found most fascinating about your book was the way you were able to describe how a boy born and raised in Europe came to imagine the United States before discovering it in the flesh. You had American friends, the children of uh, Americans living abroad uh, when you were in Vienna. Uh, you came to love American popular music and American sports before setting foot in the United States. Uh, but then uh, at the age of 11, I think it was, you, you came here for the first time. You started to come every summer. Uh, and uh, upon your arrival in the United States, you revealed your precocious talent as a sociologist because already you were observing differences between Europe and the United States. You noticed that the customs official who greeted you, for example, was an Italian immigrant. 60 years later, you couldn't quite remember his name. It might have been Marsala or Martone, uh, but you remember that he was listening to a baseball game on a transistor radio uh, and that he had a pen protector uh, in his uh, uh, open collar shirt. 
And for you, this evoked a, a tremendous difference between authority in Europe and authority in the United States. This, this was something you had never encountered in Europe, uh, an official who, though he was sitting above you and looking down on you, uh, uh, gave off this air of uh, tremendous informality and friendliness. So this was your first uh, introduction to the United States, and you immediately started making this uh, comparative sociological analysis. It continued on your cab ride into New York when you sat next to the uh, African-American cab driver who was playing rock and roll on the radio. Uh, so you started constructing this uh, uh, conceptual uh, map uh, of differences between Europe and the United States, which I, I found quite fascinating. So could you say a little bit more about how that evolved in your mind and how it related to your image of your father? Because remember, you're, you're just embarking on adolescence at this time. You're 11 years old. Uh, your father is the sole remaining authority figure in your life because you've just lost your mother. And here you discovered a new form of authority in the United States where your father's authority uh, is diminished uh, right. because of various episodes. So could you talk a little about that? Sure. Uh, I remember, you know, uh, arriving and, and Mr. M, uh, whom I give an eloge at the end. Um, uh, I always think counterfactually, uh, uh, propelled by Carl Deutsch, always think of what would have happened had this wonderful immigration officer been, you know, a jerk, a bastard, angry, whatever. What would have happened? And he wasn't. I remember not only did he have an open shirt and t-shirt uh, and the, the, the pen holder, but above all, most importantly, Art, he actually was blowing pink bubbles <laughs> and was, he was chewing bubble gum. I mean, man, this is, and to me, until then, authority figures were buttoned up, scary, uniform people. And here we are, my father grabs me by, by the hand and we're entering the United States of America. This is it, this is this guy who, and he is, uh, you know, he is what you describe. He's listening to a baseball game because clearly they, I knew that it must've been a baseball game because he would have not listened to a soccer game because the, the soccer at the time didn't exist in the United States or not in the same way. Um, and uh, it also clashes the whole thing. Then finally we come out uh, at, at Idlewild Airport and whom should we meet? I, I was hoping to see my uncle, my uncle who occasionally sent me cars to Timishara, but I didn't know who this uncle from America was. Uh, I expected it to be Cary Grant or some beautiful famous guy. And suddenly I see this old broken Jewish man shuffling to my father and they embrace each other. And this was Uncle Alex, okay, who lost four sons in Auschwitz, who had no life. I mean, how can you? Okay, his wife as well. What really still gives me the shivers that later on, uh, the, his only pleasure in life was on Sunday afternoons, he and his wife would sit in the median on 92nd Street and Broadway, where the thousands of cars go up and down Broadway. He would be sitting there they would sit there quietly, not saying a word. And occasionally I would say, uncle, why don't you walk a couple of blocks past Amsterdam, Columbus, go to the park, go to Central Park. I say, no, 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 it's just fine to sit here. So this is the guy who picks up my father and me. And this is old Europe. And we go get into this cab and they sit in the back and they talk. And then I sit in the front with this amazing African-American driver um, who listens to kick-ass rock and roll, uh, one-arming the car. It's a beautiful, sunny, early afternoon. We're driving on the, onto the, on the, the Grand Wick and onto the Triborough Bridge to Manhattan with the skyline. And I remember actually one more thing, which I somehow did not put in the book and bothered me because I actually asked him to turn up the, the volume so I could maybe understand some of the English. And I had, and my father says, turn it up even more. And I got, what? My father, hey. and the reason he wanted me to turn it up more is because I could maybe that way I could pick up better English or, or learn words. So my father was always obsessed with that I would learn. He'd never liked Hashomer Hatzair in Vienna, but there 
I would be reading early labor Zionist writers. I would be reading serious stuff, whereas in the other organization, I would not. And we arrived in New York City, and that day was just amazing how we go into Times Square, and there I see the, the camel guy smoking and puffing the smoke. And then we go to Horn and Hard Arts, which, by the way, there's a new documentary out almost on, 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 on cue, a new documentary called The Automat about Horn and Hard Art being this amazing restaurant in which you got everything from, an, from, 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 uh, from uh, vending machines. And hello, how, how can you not fall in love with a country where the uh, 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 immigration officer blows pink bubble gums where an African-American rocks and rolls with me on a, on a car down to Manhattan, where we see this guy's face puffing cigars into the, into the air, and where we get money, uh, where we get food out of the, 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 the vending machine. And this was sort of a, 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 a revelation for me and a crash for my father. Just to end it, I knew in some ways instinctively that my father's days in the United States were, count, were counted when he wanted to bribe the maitre d' in that restaurant, which he had done in Europe all the time. Not a problem. And he was smooth. My father was such a smooth, bone, a very, very elegant man who really had a complete command of his world. And he goes to bribe the maitre d' and the $10 bill falls out of the guy's hands onto the floor. And there in front of everybody, my father turns to stone. And I just, and it was embarrassing. It was horrible. And I understood somehow that he didn't know the cultural codes of what this was about. Of course, you bribe here too, but maybe you had it like this, rather than like this. Anyway, he did not have the self-confidence of bribing this guy correctly. And we decided to go back, he decided to go back. And uh, I threw a tamper tantrum uh, in, in front of the boat. And that's when we agreed to this pact uh, that I would be coming every summer. I, I didn't want to go back to Vienna. I, I, was, I was screaming, uh, the only that I would not go back to Vienna. And we went back. And, but I came every summer to New York, uh, where I stayed with the aforementioned uncle, which also became quite difficult. But then Columbia, Columbia University beckoned, and all was good. Uh, which brings me directly to my next question. You arrive uh, as a student at Columbia in 1967, <clears throat> at the beginning of the most turbulent period on American campuses in recent memory. Uh, and uh, you witnessed the occupation of uh, the buildings at Columbia. Your immigration lawyer warns you from uh, against becoming too closely involved, lest you be kicked out of the country, which would have uh, dashed all your hopes and what's more ruined your father's dreams for your future. Uh, but uh, you have some experiences at Columbia which continue uh, your uh, uh, early uh, uh, instruction in comparative sociology. One is going to a football game where you're delighted that you can pass as a genuine American because your neighbor uh, in the stands uh, does not realize that you're a kid from Europe. You know so much about American sports that you're able to pass. However, before going to the game, you asked your roommate and new friend if he wanted to go with you. And he responded with a contemptuous no, as if uh, who, who would be interested in going to a college football game? So that's one observation you make about uh, cultural differences that exist in the United States. And I would ask you to elaborate on that. And then a second experience you have at Columbia is in sitting for uh, one of your final exams. <laughs> Uh, you bring to it the mores of uh, the Viennese classroom where it was class warfare of uh, students against teachers and cheating was de rigueur. Students naturally helped their uh, classmates out because of class solidarity. But at Columbia, the proctor walked out of the room. It was strictly on the honor system. And you turn to this kid next to you and ask him for help. And he looks at you as if you're some sort of low life despite the fact that he's wearing an SDS uh, uh, badge and uh, uh, has the appearance of a hippie. So this too instructs you about cultural differences in the United States that you weren't aware of. 
So uh, could you elaborate a bit on those uh, experiences? Well, uh, let me elaborate on the second. The first one is just I go to um, I, I uh, decided that I wanted to go to uh, to a football game. And I noticed that many of my peers were not into this, into football. And for, for, for a different reason, not just the game, because it meant some. And I didn't know this at the time. And so anyway, I that's I said the other one, of course, a couple of other things. First of all, I. Uh, didn't know how to type. Um, I'm completely surprised. I mean, the, in the gymnasium, what you learned was everything by rote. It was all rote learning. It was all by, it was, it was a form of authoritarianism, which meant that we amassed an amazing amount of factual knowledge, but nothing creative. And so suddenly I'm confronted literally the first day of class with writing papers. What? Writing papers? What do you do? What do you mean writing papers? We never wrote a paper in gymnasium, ever. You wrote in, in, cl in the classroom, wrote exams. Um, and I had no idea how to do this. Moreover, I didn't know how to type. So I always say the first thing I learned at Columbia is how to type. Um, that exam was, by the way, not a final, it was a midterm, thank God. It was the only blue book exam I have failed. Uh, the guy looked at me with utter contempt and total disdain and hatred, sort of like on two levels. On one hand, hey, you jerk, you're now at Columbia University. What's the matter with you? You don't, you can't cut it. And sort of you lowlife, don't you understand that you're cheating? So to me, and then when he saw, I saw the SDS button, it was a, a, a very, very scary thing. Um, and, and it was embarrassing, and above all, also failed the exam. Um, there are many other sort of uh, uh, links, like uh, where 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 um, Europe clashes with America, uh, but Colombia very quickly becomes a a beacon for me. I mean, uh, 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 classes with and just people like Ira Katznelson, um, uh, Mark Kesselman. Uh, uh, Alan Silver, I mean, these are Joseph Rothschild, um, Severin Bialer, uh, the, you know, these are life transforming people who make me who I am. Um, and, and it's through them in, in ways that I become interested in various aspects of political sociology, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, et cetera, et cetera, among others, Lipset. And it's through this that I then transition into the Center for European Studies right after finishing my PhD. Uh, okay, so that gives us the perfect segue to move to Peter Hall. I have many more questions that I could ask you, but uh, time is running short. So uh, let me turn it over to Peter. Okay. Um, so Andy, Andy, it's a wonderful book. I mean, you leap from its pages and uh, you bring with you quite a remarkable cast of characters. And um, of course, I was very interested in uh, uh, what you write about your experiences at uh, the Center for European Studies and uh, beyond. Um, I don't know if you uh, realize this, but uh, uh, of course you came to Harvard um, uh, uh, in the fall of 1975 uh, and uh, I did as well. And I too hope to uh, study with Seymour Martin Lipset only to discover as you did to your surprise that he was leaving for Stanford that fall. Uh, and I too registered in the course that Barrington Moore was to offer on <laughs> cruelty, uh, which he then canceled because among his many lists of cruelties, he didn't include chronic back pain. So uh, I felt like, you know, we were in parallel, a parallel universe at uh, the same point in time in, many ways. And uh, your accounts of uh, the early CES are very evocative. I'm sure there are many people uh, on the, in this webinar who are, uh, were associated with the center then or in the later years. So I, I, I really want to ask you um, uh, mainly to um, uh, say a little bit more about your impressions of the center uh, in those uh, early years. So, you know, what did you leave out of, of the chapter as you write about that? Uh, and, and I think one of the things that strikes me the most is uh, your description of how welcoming uh, the center was. Uh, uh, 
I must say, by the way, I have no idea how you recall all these events and conversations uh, in so much detail. I'm just, I can barely remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. I, it's, it's just astonishing. But could, um, why do you think the center was such a welcoming place? Was this um, a, a kind of peculiar accident of fate just for you? Was there something broader uh, to that as, as you experienced the center in um, uh, the, 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 its early decades? Uh, um, yeah, what would you say about that? Well, I mean, it's really both. It's, it's clearly a, a, a creation of the time. Um, it, and very much, I think, the creation of the Troika that ran it and, and organized it, namely, or, uh, namely Stanley Hoffman, Guido Goldman, and Abby Collins. Uh, let me just uh, say first how I get there. And, and, and um, you know, it's, I arrive at Lipset's office, uh, uh, you know, and, he, un, un, and, and, and it's packed with boxes. And I say, I say, oh, I'm coming here to work with, which was, of course, a total chutzpah. I mean, he didn't walk, he had, and didn't apply to any of this. This is what's so amazing. It's a whole thing is a charade. And uh, I said, uh, and he said, uh, you can't work with me because I'm on my way to Stanford. Uh, I said, and I, my life, uh, what do you mean, Stanford? Okay. Um, and, but then he takes out a pen and he writes a note, which to this, I have no idea what, what said, what was in the note. But this note changed my life. He tells me, you take it to the Center for European Studies and give it to Guido Goldman. By the way, Peter, it's very interesting to me. I'm not quite sure why he didn't write it to Stanley. Well, I one would have assumed that Lipset was in the league with Stanley and that he would write it to him, but actually he wrote it to Guido Goldman. And I go, Guido Goldman, son of Nahum? And he said, the, the very one. And I take it, he even tells me how to go, get out of William James, uh, Francis Avenue, on the way to Francis Avenue. In Francis Avenue, I run into this tall guy called, I mean, I recognize it's uh, 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 John Kenneth Galbraith. And I enter the center and there is this amazingly warm, sunny, uh, kind, slightly sort of uh, skeptical look woman, Abby Collins, who is just, uh, now, you know, the very fact that Abby Collins is at the center is not by chance, but clearly the, the person of Abby Collins is sui generis. And she could have easily, you know, taken the, I said, I, I'm here to, uh, to, um, to give this letter to Dr. Goldman. Dr. Goldman isn't here. But she's welcoming, and she started. We, we had this amazing conversation. I remember she looked at me funny, a little bit because I was wearing all these beads, love beads. Um, and but the place, you know, I always I've thought about this, Peter. I don't think this would have happened in the newer center because it was this funky building, and so Abby and uh, was, was sitting there. Was sitting there on the couch, and then in comes Peter Gorvich, and Peter Lang, and Rick Gordon, and Leonie Gordon and um, John Keeler and Bornstein. Uh, and they all are, there's no hierarchy. I don't quite know who the graduate students are, who the faculty are. Peter Lang is faculty, not really, he is, of course. And they all schmooze and we're talking and we're talking about Bill Spaceman Lee, who was the, then an important pitcher for the Boston Red Sox. And I just, it's incredible. And then comes lunchtime. And again, Abby is the leader here. Says, oh, no, no, don't go to the Har Harvard Square. That's too far. Let's we all just, you know, eat something. And it was like this commune. It was this also, you know, the, the Le Monde and Figaro and, and Süddeutsche Zeitung, they're all lying about and these amazing posters. And amazing. Uh, that is part of the zeitgeist. It, so it's a mixture, I would say. It's a mixture of, of an entity that really is post-68, and it's very much part of this new left, uh, uh, new institutionalism, Weber, post-Weberian, Weber, Marx, uh, you know, very much that. But in addition to that, of course, it is the amazing laissez-faire attitude towards this by Stanley Hoffman. 
who just lets this, you know, tear, I, I will rue the word that I'm using, the great Stanley Hoffman to equate him with, uh, in terms of uh, uh, usage with Mark, uh, with Mao, you know, let 100 flowers bloom, because um, Stanley is a mensch, Mao was not. And, and um, you know, he basically let it flourish. And in, I never forget that one of the center's um, uh, 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 jubilees, um, some, someone asked him about the state and capitalism seminar, your brilliant seminar, Peter. And he said, uh, I must say, I know nothing about it. I just don't even know it exists, let alone having been there. Now, that takes a lot of grandeur to do this, a lot of security, a lot of, he could have completely done, he could have been, it could have been a center of on international relations or whatever Stanley would have wanted it to be. And that doesn't happen. And so clearly he, his laissez-faire make, allows a Gurvich, allows a, a, allows you, allows state and capitalism to, to flourish and develop this amazing, I remember these amazing seminars with Jim Kurth and Peter Katzenstein and Ira Katznelson. And this was the, 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 the mecca of modern sort of then critical political economy, whatever. And, uh, and then clearly Guido. Guido as this um, fascinating figure and who, when I, I never forget this, when he walks in, finally, after all, I'm there waiting for Guido when I meet the wonderful Peter Gurvich and all these people, okay? You were not, not there yet. I mean, not at the center then. Um, and you, I, I have you in memory like a little, a little later, a year later, a year and a half later or so. Right. Um, and I mean, there were some amazing also young uh, uh, female faculty member, Rosemary Taylor, Mary Molly Nolan, of course, uh, um, uh, 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 Suzanne Berger, and some great graduate students, Joel Krieger, uh, Leah Zell, uh, Judy Eisenberg, the late Judy Eisenberg, uh, Judy Vishniak, and of course, my Michigan colleague, Margaret Summers, Peggy Summers. They were all part of this sort of mishmash of Andersonian, Andre Gunther Frank, uh, you know, Perry Anderson, Waller Stinian world. And Guido was again above it all, but yet made it all possible. And I had the good fortune of meeting him that afternoon and we go up and I, I say to him, um, you're the son of Nahum Goldman and he completely startled and he said, I don't, don't know many people who know my father like you. And I said, I don't know him. I just remember that my father took me to a major meeting where it was uh, where he, your father spoke. And you have to understand, Guido, that to the diaspora Jewry outside of the United States, Nahum Goldman is a saint. He is the guy who basically got my uncle and aunt some Wiedergutmachung's money. Not much, but some. And it's all Nahum Goldman. So Nahum Goldman was a, a, a saint. And uh, Guido uh, made all that possible. And I've become very close to him, as close as one can with Guido. Uh, it all remains in the realm of German politics, of uh, basketball, which I share with him so much, of uh, uh, ro bicycle racing, and above all of dogs. And, um, and that's the center for me. I mean, uh, it's, it's a, and, and also the, 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 the liberty that it allowed. I mean, uh, uh, think about this. Um, you know, I come back in 1986 uh, uh, from a trip uh, abroad and I decided at the summer I wanted to write something on why soccer isn't played in America. And I write this paper. And by the way, you know who my research assistant is? It's the one and only Karen Donfrey who probably rues the fact that she's no longer the president of German Marshall Fund and is hanging out now with Anthony Blinken and others, you know, managing Putin. I mean, because she, of course, is now the assistant secretary of Europe and Eurasian affairs. And Karen Donford is my research assistant. And somehow you get, a, uh, you get wind of this paper and you ask me to present it in state and capitalism. Uh, Amazing, absolutely amazing. Uh, a certain kind of intellectual 
brilliance, but also liberty, a certain kind of security, a status security that the center has that allows this to happen. At the time, research on sports was completely unacceptable in a serious place like Harvard or unacceptable. Uh, and actually, it reminds me that the reason I become this sports researcher is because of you, because of the center. And then a couple of years, decade later, with the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, where I arrive, and again, a similar institution of, of, of immense security. Uh, I remember we had to say to meet Wolf Lepernese and uh, uh, tell him what our project for the year was. And I told you know, my, my book just appeared, The Stoiche Dilemma, which was the German translation of the German predicament. And I wanted to work more on this, I, you know, something about EU. And, and I never forget his reaction. He looks at me and it goes like this. <laughs> boring, boring. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Said, Didn't you write an article on why there is no soccer in America, which was published in Leviathan? I said, yes, I did. 12 years ago. I want you to do a book on that. That's what the Vico is about. That became my famous offside. And then he also, you know, it's brilliant. And then he, I never forget this before when I left his, oh, by the way, please do some research for me why the hook shot in the NBA has completely been discarded. No <laughs> one shoots the hook shot anymore. And I go, wow. And that's the center. And that's the Vico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think I've got time only for one other quick question, maybe do I art? Um, yes. Um, Andy, um, I think you just described very nicely uh, the role that Stanley played in the, and uh, one of his core contributions to the center. Um, it's interesting to me that uh, you developed um, such a close relationship with Guido. I mean, Guido is probably the only uh, member of the jet set that I ever uh, uh, knew in my life. And it, um, there are ways in which it's not a naturally close relationship. Um, uh, can you say a little bit more about um, what it is that brought you and Guido uh, together? Oh man, another, a clearly similar backgrounds, obviously being Jewish, although he was very differently Jewish. Um, and we actually never much talked about that. Um, some of it was actually sometimes strange when every Christmas he sent me this beautiful Weihnachtsstollen out of from Munich. Hello, I mean, uh, you can't be less Jewish than that. And never, you know, he never ever wished me for a Jewish <clears throat> holiday, which is fine. I, I didn't, but you know, it was a but clearly being Jewish is a key, key role here. Clearly, our fathers. I mean, Guido uh, facilitated one of the most exciting days of my life when he asked me to spend an entire day with Malcolm Goldman. And he was visiting uh, Nathan Pusey was the president of Harvard and I'm not quite sure who the president of MIT was at the time. And I was the chaperoning around and we sat the, the whole time sitting in this limousine talking about politics. And he told me these amazing stories of Ben Gurion and Moshe Charret and, 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 and Golda lots about Golda and on, I mean, there's just uh, Yossi, you know, Tito, and of course, Schmidt and Cole and all of these. And um, uh, so clearly our fathers play a role here. Obviously Germany plays a role here. Um, Guido's, Guido's Germany was not my Germany. Guido's Germany was elite Germany. He knew, he, and I don't think he was showing off. He really meant when he, got, I just got a phone call from Helmut Schmidt. I hung out with this, whatever. I mean, these, that, 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 that was his circle. My circle, as I talk in the book, are German uh, academics, uh, political sociologists, and Heinz Klunke, the, the, the big uh, trade union boss of the Employees Association. And, but the clearly G Germany plays a crucial role in this. Um, and uh, it's a form, and, and as I said, and even, even dogs in a, in a weird way. He absolutely adored his, his dogs, so did I. It's the only time that Guido, I mean, um, really showed amazing emotion. When I lost Dovey, he made an amazingly high um, money contribution to the Yankee Golden Retriever Rescue Society. Um, no, Guido was, um, 
unique. He also, I think in a way, Guido was like I was in some ways a kind of orthogonal, askew. He wasn't, he was an academic, but not an academic. He was a businessman, but not a businessman. He was, um, you know, totally in with the Germans, but he was not one of them. So like, just like me, I'm kind of, um, you know, I, I, the Germans, obviously, I know their culture. I am German, but not really. I'm, you know, I talk about these, the, the three magic wands that opened Germany for me. Number one, Harvard, um, which is an, a sesame that opens everywhere, but in Germany, I've never seen anything like this. Number two, speaking Viennese accented German, which for some reason the Germans love. Um, it's elegant, it's sexy, it's cultured, it's uh, whatever. And number three, because I'm Jewish and in some ways manageably Jewish. I'm not wearing a kafta, I'm not wearing pears, I don't speak with a Yiddish accent. I'm sort of acceptable, but not quite. And that, of course, and Guido was like that too. For example, I always was found, always found it very weird in some ways also interesting how he often used Jewish jokes in front of the Germans, which is a form of épater les Germans, like épater les Allemands kind of, you know, to show up. And anyway, but Guido, I miss him horribly. I miss him horribly. I'm so, so, so sad that he never got, uh, you know, got to a copy of this book in which I really, I think, um, treating with homage. And we didn't get to talk about, obviously, the one and only Karl Deutsch, uh, who actually oh. was not at the center, but whom, through whom I, uh, it's through the center that I meet Karl. And, uh, you know, and the so passages that, in the book about uh, Karl Deutsch are really wonderful passages as well, Andy. There's so much in this book. I wish we had more time to discuss it. Yeah, I, I think that's a, an appropriate note on which to end. Uh, you've done exactly what we hoped you would do, uh, particularly in evoking uh, the early days of the Center for European Studies. Uh, and it's really been a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. And thanks to uh, Peter and Anne for uh, agreeing to participate and uh, to the center staff for uh, uh, facilitating all this and making the event possible. So thanks again, Andy. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just love you. Thank you so much. The center is, is the best. Uh, will always be something very, very dear to me. And, and uh, I apologize that we didn't have time for questions, uh, but uh, uh, perhaps we'll do it again sometime. Bye, everyone. <laughs>